In this episode, we're going to be looking at the economic effects of the dog in the manger. Now, the dog in the manger was a character from Aesop's fables. A dog who commandeered the manger, he had no interest in eating the hay, but he kept all the animals from getting it. Land speculators are the dogs in the manger. Now, in our, in our search for a villain, we not, might not be finding a snidely whiplash kind of villain. Land speculation was once an occupation as practiced by people like John Jacob Astor, Cornelius Vanderbilt, or even George Washington, who, history tells us, had some pretty large landed investments in Kentucky and made a bunch of money from them. But today, land speculation is fully integrated in the economy. And that's what makes its effects, its pernicious effects, harder to see. So to see how this works, let's back up. Let's uh, look at this step by step. Let's say you get a little bit ahead economically. You have some extra wealth that you'd like to save or invest. Okay, You can save it in a savings account in a bank and get a guaranteed very safe and very low return from it. Or you can invest it in something that maybe has higher risk but will bring you a bigger return. Investors always weigh risk against return. You can invest in all kinds of things. You can invest in stocks or mutual funds, real estate, antiques, startup businesses. And the balance of risk and return in all of the various investments that people can choose gives economics its romance and its interest for people who follow it. But from our point of view, from the point of view of political economy, the things you can invest in are three only, the factors of production, labor, capital, and land. Now, if you invest in labor, that means you're educating yourself to make your own labor more valuable. We're going to take that as a given, and for today, we're going to look at the consequences of investing in capital and in land. Okay? Now, to see how this works, we need to remember the difference between land and capital that we went over in our basic definitions. People invest in productive capital if that brings a better return than investing in land. This creates a problem for us because, as we've seen, the value of society's increased productivity tends to concentrate on the better locations. This means that land values in desirable locations tend to increase faster than the overall economy's growth rate. This makes land a very desirable investment. To see how this works, we're going to compare an investment of $150,000 in either one building or five vacant lots in the same city under the same condition. This would amount to $120,000 for the building and $30,000 for the lot beneath it compared to five vacant lots at $30,000 a piece. Which would be the better investment? We'll use the following ground rules. The interest on the capital value of the building is at the general rate of an interest, which we're saying is 3%. In other words, you wouldn't invest in that building unless you could get at least as much of a return on it as you could investing that money in some other place. So the interest on the building is 3%. The building's rental income is $1,000 per month or $12,000 a year. And the land value increase is 10% or $3,000 a year, which in a good economy is a standard rate of increase of land values. The annual cost of maintenance and management and other costs associated with running the building comes to $6,000 a year. And property tax is 2.5% of the total real estate value, which comes to $3,750 a year. We take the total gross annual income of $18,600, subtract the expenses, we come up with a net profit of $8,850, and a return on our investment of $150,000 in the one building of 5.9%. Okay, so let's look at our return on five vacant lots. You've made a total investment of $150,000 by buying five vacant lots at $30,000 a piece. Land value is increasing at 10% a year, so the total annual increase of your five lots is $15,000. The only expense you have is your property tax because, of course, they're vacant lots. You don't have any maintenance and management expenses. 
So the property tax is the same 2.5% on the $150,000 investment as you had on your building because you made the same investment. It's $37.50. That leaves you with a net profit of $11,250 for a return on investment of 7.5%. A considerably higher return on investment than we got by actually running the building and providing housing for people. Now the return on investment on the five vacant lots is potential. It is in their selling price or in their value because you haven't done anything with the lots, you're holding them idle. But nevertheless, if you're interested, as many investors are, in a long-term investment, you're better off having those five vacant lots because your return on investment is going to be greater. That example shows a very clear-cut difference. In most cases, of course, people invest in both. And the most common and most influential real estate investment in our economy is people's mortgage for their homes. They invest in both the land and the house. Okay? Here's a house, for example. I wonder, is it worth $100,000 or is it worth $1 million? There's no way to tell from the picture. What's the difference? The difference is where it is. And the value of people's homes appreciate with the value of the locations that those people did nothing to create. Economist Mason Gaffney wrote this very interesting statement on the extent of sprawl in our society. Gaffney wrote, in the Milwaukee, Wisconsin suburban communities of Sherwood and Whitefish Bay, each house about 10,000 people per square mile in the green comfort of detached houses on tree-lined streets, at the density of these upper middle class suburbs, the entire U.S. population, 300 million, would require 30,000 square miles, which is a bit less than the area of South Carolina. This is the area of a circle whose radius is 98 miles. If that seems too crowded, we could divide the needed area among 50 states. It would be the area of 50 cities of radius 13.8 miles each. Either way you cut it, or any other way, it is lost in the vastness of the United States of America. This is the main way in which land speculation hurts and retards our economy and, incidentally, our environment. To illustrate this, we have modified our model and added another facet of the real world to make it a bit more accurate. In our earlier model, workers on the better grades of land were able to produce more units of wealth. But what happens in the real world also is that because of concentrated population and increased infrastructure, pieces of land in the best places can also support more workers. So a lot in the center city not only will have the most productive workers working there, but more of them will be able to work there. Instead of working in single-story shopping malls, they'll be working in skyscrapers. So to illustrate that in this model, we've said that not only are workers on the better grades of land more productive, but more of them can work there. And the best land in the center city in our model, each worker can produce five units of wealth per day, and 50 workers can be employed on each plot of land. Okay? Now let's say in our little economy, in our little model, there are four plots of each grade of land. Three of them are put to productive use, but one of them is held out of use for speculation. It's a vacant lot. Now, there were 50 workers who would have been happy to work there and could have been productive working there, but because there's nothing going on on that lot, they're not able to work there. So there are 50 workers in the economy that could have been producing five units of wealth per day, but they're not. They're producing less. On the next best land in our model, each worker produces four units of wealth per day instead of five because they're not quite as productive as those who can afford to be on the best land. And 40 workers per plot can work there because there isn't quite as much infrastructure and not quite as much building as there is on the best land. But once again, there are four plots of land. Three of them are put to productive use. One of them is held out of use for speculation. So now, once again, there are 40 workers who could have been working for making four units of wealth per day, but aren't. They're making less. So we see that that diminution of productivity propagates throughout the entire economy, and each segment of the economy, each, each grade of land, 
is used less productively than it could be if they were all put to productive use. Now to show the effect of this on the whole economy, we've totaled up the number of workers who are employed on each grade of land, the overall output of wealth that they're producing per day, and the cost of infrastructure. This is just an arbitrary number that I've added for comparison, but I've made it proportional to the population. Because if you have more people employed, and more people have to go to and from this place, it's going to cost more to create the public infrastructure that facilitates their being there. So the cost of infrastructure is going to tend to be proportional to population. So if we add it up, we can see that on our best land, we've got 150 workers employed. There would be infrastructure and there would be enough land there for 200 to be employed, but 50 aren't because one of those plots of land is being held out of use. The infrastructure cost is $200 and the wealth output is 750. Well, it could be 1,000, but once again, 50 workers are not producing 50 units of wealth each on that land because that land is not put to productive use. And the next best grade of land, there's 120 workers employed, 40 on each of three plots of land. There could be 160, but 40 of them are not working because that land is held out of productive use. Once again, on the third best grade of land, there are 90 workers employed, 30 each on three plots of land. There could be 120, but there aren't because one of those plots of land is held out of productive use. Now, because of the fact that we don't use the land effectively, we've created a system in which our economy has an inherent inefficiency. And we look to remember Brad, the lazy worker who could only produce half the wealth of the average worker. Well, he ended up being unemployable the way the economy was because there was always a worker who could compete better than him and there wasn't a place for him to go to find employment. There is a, a residual level of unemployment in our economy. There are 50 workers. And let's say that the cost of subsistence is one unit of wealth per day. So our society has to find the money. They've got to tax the producers and find the money to pay the cost of keeping those people alive because they can't find work. So the cost of 50 unemployed workers is 50 units per day. These people are simply a drain on the economy because, well, we've decided as a society that we want to keep them alive. We don't want them to just die, but we have to support them somehow. So there's a welfare cost of 50, okay? And that's added to the overall infrastructure cost. Now let's see what would happen in our economy if we could get rid of the economic institution of land speculation, if we could put all the land to productive use when there was a demand for doing so. Now, if we can do that, all four of our plots of the best land are put to productive use. On each of them, there are 50 workers all making five units of wealth per day. Those workers who heretofore had to go to less productive land to find work are able to get access to the best land and put their superior skills to, to use. This is repeated on all the other grades of land. And since there was a great deal of land held out of use before, we can now employ 500 workers and yet still have some free land. Because off at the margin, all the land that had been held out of use before is now available. We no longer have 50 unemployed workers because all of the workers can find productive employment as we put our land to productive use across the board. And this shows us a very interesting wrinkle of the kind of economy we could expect if we could get rid of the drag of land speculation. We could afford to provide infrastructure even on some land that was free. People like Brad, who couldn't find work anywhere else, could go and have a place where there were roads and where there were schools. And the land wouldn't cost anything because there is an abundance of land available in the economy. And how do we know this is true? Because we look around us everywhere today and we see huge amounts of highly valuable land that are held out of use, that no one is using and no one is getting access to. So let's look at our totals in this economy now that we have 
put the land to productive and sensible use. On the best land, we have 200 workers employed instead of 150 because we put all four plots to their highest and best economic use. The infrastructure cost is the same as before because we always provided infrastructure. We always expected that lot to be used. That's one of the things that gave it its speculative value and, had, and gave the owner the incentive to hang on to it all that time. So we don't have to increase the cost of infrastructure to provide infrastructure because that's already there. Okay. Likewise, on the second best land, instead of 120, there are now 160 workers working because all four plots are put to productive use. And so all the workers have shifted over to work on the good land, to work on the land where their skills are most effectively used. This means that there's some land on the 20 plots that is free. Immigrants or new workers can go there and they can help the economy grow and they can start businesses and there's even some infrastructure provided for that land, the infrastructure that was provided before when people were using that land. So let's look at the totals in our new economy in which we've gotten rid of land speculation. We no longer have unemployment because all the workers can find places to work. That means all 500 of the people in our economy are working, an increase in employment of 50 over the 450 we had before. Our wealth output has increased tremendously because of all of the workers who became more productive as they were able to move to better locations and put their skills and experience to better use. We have a net increase in output of 390 units in the same time. That shows you the degree of economic waste, of wasted economic potential that we have in our economy today. And the infrastructure cost is actually less because we're not required to provide infrastructure for land that isn't being used at all. It's gone down. Our government has gotten a bargain in providing infrastructure for this more efficiently used land in our economy. We talk about land being held out of use for speculation Actually, underuse of land is an even bigger problem than simply holding land idle. Large parking lots around big box stores, gas stations on valuable city corners, old buildings only partially used, perhaps a retail store at ground level and many empty floors above, suburban strip malls. You can go on and on. Look, once you start thinking of examples, you can see millions of them. Over large residential lots with big lawns watered by aquifer depleting subsidized water. Golf courses with subsidized water. Roads, 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 traffic everywhere you look. This is the character of our sprawling society and our inefficient economy. Reversing the tendency towards sprawl would yield both economic benefits and environmental benefits. So this is where we are. Land speculation benefits most households in the U.S. and in other modern economies, but it harms the whole community. We've got a problem. Remember some of those trade-offs we started talking about when we took, came up with our basic questions, right? We have a public policy problem. How do we make sure there's enough productive investment to keep the economy growing without endangering the investments, including the retirement nest eggs, of a majority of people. Or in other words, our economy has a structural problem that, thus far anyway, we have no interest in fixing. Thanks for watching everybody. Understanding Economics is a presentation of the Henry George School of Social Science with videography by Uladzimir Takachu. In our next lesson, we look at the role of capital and political economy.